Okay. Cut Snapdragons. Cut Snapdragons, this is one of the, one of the uh, crops that has not gone offshore. Um, it's still, most of them are produced in the United States. Um, the genus and species is Antherinum ma uh, magis, and it's a member of the Scrofulary AC family, and um, they have um, uh, very interesting flowers. It's uh, originated from the Mediterranean region, so it's, it's a cool climate plant. Um, the um, the bloom is, uh, it's considered a tender uh, summer forcing perennial. They will, they will perennate in the gardens, but uh, not, not commonly. Mostly if you see them coming back in the garden in our area, it's coming back from seed. They're open pollinated, so the seed that you're gonna get from, if you're collecting your own seed, they're gonna revert back to the female parent primarily if you do pollinate them and collect seed. The early cultivars in the United States were all open pollinated, but they were inbred lines. In other words, they're breeding back on themselves um, to produce the seed. And they were bred to bloom uh, with long days, long day photo period. The United States, um, most of the cut snapdragon production is in California. California alone dwarfs all the other states. Uh, we have a handful of growers in Colorado and we have a handful of growers in Florida and other parts of the country, but almost the entire production of cut snapdragons is in California. And so here's a spectrum of, of where that is. Um, you know, if it's not in California, it's in Florida a little bit in Colorado, across the spectrum. And the pretty much it's, it's, it's the same pick. And um, the value of, um, uh, even though this is 10-year-old data, the value really hasn't changed either. Um, fuel prices have changed. Um, but um, you can see that as the volume changes, the prices have changed. And it's still, we're still selling uh, about uh, a cut snapdragon at about 20, between 25 and 28 cents a stem. The local, the local markets, if you're growing a crop locally and, and, and targeting a local, local wholesale house or something like this, typically you can get a little bit more per stem than if you're growing for a large regional area. So um, as you can see, in Colorado, we're getting almost 40, over 40 cents a stem, uh, whereas California and Florida, where most of the production is, they're getting um, a quarter or less per stem. And it's the areas where they're focusing on very specialty markets is where they're getting a better value. So, the cut snapdragon history is um, they're an F1 hybrid, and the F1 hybrids, uh, the first F1 hybrid that was developed for the greenhouse industry was called Christmas Cheer. It developed in the late 1930s, and it was followed by uh, Marilyn Pink, Mary Ellen, and Dorcas Jane. And what they were focusing on in their early breeding work in the 30s, into the 40s, uh, all the way up into the 50s, was breeding around winter blooming, trying to get a winter blooming um, snapdragon so we could focus on the day length, more day length sensitive. Yoder Brothers picked up the carnation breeding in the, in the 1950s. Um, now almost all the carnation, uh, snapdragon breeding, excuse me, Snapdragon breeding uh, for sna um, is done by Ball Horticulture uh, under one of their subsidiary companies called Pan American Seed Company. Uh, Pan American Seed Company actually uh, was started by uh, a couple gentlemen. Um, one of them was uh, Bob Holly.
Now, the genetics of snapdragons, and we're, we're doing all of our production from seedlings, um, since the, the development, working with the um, force, winter forcing characteristics, the genetics are, are classified into several groups. Group one is what we call the winter series. And when you go to the catalogs, and I put in a link in uh, RAM CT to the Pan American Seed Catalog, so you can go ahead and look at the different groupings and how they're classified. The winter group one, they're uh, bred for short days, low light levels, with uh, reasonably cool night temperatures, okay? Group two is late winter and where they're gonna bloom with a little longer photo period, a little higher light level, and a little warmer temperature. So when you start programming, if you're growing snapdragons, and most growers will grow snapdragons so that we plant one week. We're planting a bench every week, but we're harvesting a bench every week, so we have a rotation. And you have to choose what you're planting based upon the groups. Group three is a spring series where medium to long days, moderate to high light, and night temperatures 55 to 60. Now we call it a spring series, but it could also be a fall series as well. Okay, so group three also fits with the fall. For instance, if you're going for a Christmas crop. Group four is designed for hot, high temperature, long days, and for these schedules. So these are the, the four classifications, and these are genetically distinct groups. They're bred to, to respond this way. So here are the, um, the flowering period. So this is, for instance, group one. We're primarily looking on harvesting those flowers between December 1 and February 15, which is your Valentine's Day crops. November 1, I mean, group two is February 15 to May 1, or November 1 to December 1. That's, those are your late fall, early winter as well as um, late winter, early spring. Group three is your late spring through summer and early fall through mid fall. And of course, group four is the middle of summer. Seed to flower. And what this refers to is how many days from sowing the seed to harvesting a flower. And we'll show you at the stage where we harvest flowers and you count back from those days. Now, if you're going to be planting plugs, getting your plugs from a specialty propagator, you take two weeks off of that number, 14 days. Because 14 days of this is, is in seed development, seedling development. So in the early days, those first inbred lines, they were all done by, cu by cuttings. <coughs> However, snapdragon rust is endemic and can be transla uh, translocated in the system and they had a lot of rust problems where we were uh, transmitting rust in uh, throughout the crops with cuttings. So they went away from cuttings for disease control and the inbred lines reduced a lot of this problem and with F1 hybrids, uh, we get, we're getting more vigorous plants. Almost all greenhouse forcing snapdragon um, seed production is actually greenhouse grown. And what this does is it prevents seed borne diseases because there are some diseases that we can get in snapdragons that will actually, uh, we can get them through the seed. For instance, downy mildew can be transmitted through the seed from infected plants. Uh, seedling production of snapdragons is fairly easy. Uh, they, germin they germinate well under intermittent mist. What we do is we, we sow the seed, keep the soil temperature relatively warm, 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and we use intermittent mist on well-drained media so it's continually moist but not sitting in water. And the temperature should be a little on the lower side 
and we usually get germination in about 10 days. Now snapdragons are transplanted when you have the f after you have the first true leaflet or between two to four true, true leaves have been formed. The first leaf is the cotyledon leaf, okay? And we'll usually see this two to three weeks after germination. So if you're germinating your own snapdragon seed, we already have investment of 10 days plus two to three weeks on the bench with our crop. And that's why it's more economical to buy your seedlings from a specialty propagator. And almost everybody does, buys their plugs from specialty propagators and they're expensive, but you're paying for this. Now, snapdragons have an extremely fragile xylem, okay? And we, when we are transplanting, if you're transplanting seedlings the, the, that you've just sown in a tray and you're pricking them out with, a, with a, your fingers or something like this, snapdragon seedlings should never be handled by the stem. They should always be handled by the cotyledon leaf. Uh, pick them up by their ears is what I call it, you know. The moms in the room understand that, right? Pick them up by their ears. Because if you grab them by the stem, you can't not crush the stem. So you want to make sure you harvest them by the leaflet. Plugs from specialty propagators are much more economical. You don't have to devote uh, space to propagation facilities. It's going to reduce your production time by two weeks. So if you have 110 days, 21 days is, or your study is in, of your production is in propagation. It doesn't seem like, you know, here we're saying 110 days, 21 days in propagation, reducing it about two weeks. There is that week of transplant shock, which equals, where's that difference between 14 and 21 days comes in. So then you're going to get some vigor and actually cut your whole production down by 75. So plug, using vigorous plugs is going to give you a faster yield, less bench time, and so you get faster turnover for your crop schedules. Of course, plugs are much more expensive than seed, but it's reduced bench time. Snapdragons are primarily grown on raised benches. Some people grow them in ground beds, raised benches primarily with a very light mix, one-to-one -one peat perlite. If it's native soil, equal parts peat soil perlite. Uh, if you're using ground beds, it has to be well-drained and it has to be pasteurized. And most growers that are growing snapdragons are using uh, steam pasteurization at 180 degrees Fahrenheit in the coldest place for 30 minutes. Nutrition, these are not heavy feeders. They do not like to be overfed. 100 parts per million equal parts nitrogen and potassium is all they need. They are not heavy feeders. Whereas other crops we've talked about um, use as much as we give them. We need to have more nitrate than ammonium. I think you've heard me say that before. More nitrate than ammonium. If you use too much fertilizer or if you use too much fertilizer in the ammoniacal form, we get a condition that's called grassy growth. Now what grassy growth is in a snapdragon is lots of vegetation branching off the main, the main stem. And it just looks like it's got too much foliage. And we're generating foliage, we're not generating flowers. It's, it's what we call grassy growth. Of course, mag magnesium deficiency. So one of the things I mentioned earlier is about steaming your soil is that steamed soil, we need to shoot for 180 degrees for 30 minutes in the coldest part. Snapdragons are stunted by a condition called fire mold. Now this is a, pyreneem this is a pyrenemia infection on a, on a, on a ground bed. Now what pyrenemia is, is it's a uh, slime mold. 
It, and it's a saprophytic organization, sa or saprophytic organism. Saprophytic means it feeds on dead stuff. So it's not feeding on the snapdragon plugs. And this is from wh where we see fire mold is when, the, when your potting soil has been oversteamed, overpasteurized, and slime molds are what we call early colonizers. They're there all the time. We never see them because the rhizosphere is in balance and there's all kinds of bugs ch chomping and eating on each other. These seedlings look stunted though because the slime mold itself is shedding water. It's not allowing good water penetration. That we see slime molds from oversteaming soils. And actually, if you were to walk up into the, mount the foothills into areas where there's been heavy fire, you'll see this very uh, organism in the mountains. It's everywhere, it's endemic. What happens in a fire zone or after a forest fire is the soil is sterile. In nature, this is the first colonizer. And it's a problem in the greenhouse. The solution is easy. Just go in there and rake the mycelium. You can kill it with a fungicide, which you haven't gotten rid of the watershedding characteristics. So it's just easier just to go in there and rake it and break it up so the water can penetrate. And it, we do see this pretty regularly in um, snapdragons. So like I said, snapdragons are planted in a staggered fashion or staged. And here we can see these, these raised beds of snapdragons, these are, these are newly planted plugs. These are planted a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, on through the whole s cycle. And so when they harvest these beds, they'll clean those up and replant them for the next, next cycle. And that's how they work. It's a staged planting system so that you can have a consistent crop here we see the workers planting um, plugs, and it is all hand work. The um, flower netting, they need to have layers of flower netting to keep that stem straight, because crooked stems and snapdragons aren't worth anything. And these gentlemen are just planting their plants. And just more pictures. These are um, snapdragons that are ready to harvest. Here we can see where this grower is actually growing um, his snapdragons in uh, bulb crates. And the, the practice of using bulb crates is that he can clear that greenhouse space for another crop at a different time. Lilies are another crop that haven't moved offshore. Actually, these pictures are from Jordan's greenhouse here in uh, Fort Collins. Nutrient deficiency, um, the nutrients that are easily uh, occur with snapdragons because they're not heavy feeders, therefore we're not putting a lot of fertilizer on. Some nutrients become deficiency and one of the primary ones is magnesium. And we see that with an intravenal uh, chlorosis on the new tissue and necrosis or burned edges and burned margins on old leaves. Sulfur. Uh, this is one of the few crops that you'll see a sulfur deficiency on. I told you earlier that sulfur deficiency is almost always created in the lab. This is one of the species they use to demonstrate sulfur deficiency in the lab. Iron, uh, intravenal yellowing on the youngest leaves, primarily see iron uh, deficiency if the soil temperature is too cold, too cold. Boron deficiency, uh, we see that where we'll get lots of uh, grassy growth without a terminal uh, apex and real bushy plants. And we typically see uh, boron deficiency, not so much if it's deficient in the, in, the, in the system, but if we're using too much calcium fertilizer, because the calcium is pre, um, preferentially taken up by the plant. So the calcium deficiency can cause, cal calcium, excess of calcium can cause a problem. So that's one of the reasons why we don't use calcium nitrate as a fertilizer 
in Snapdragons. Snapdragon roots, just about everything kills them. Uh, Pythium and Rhizoctonia are our biggest enemies. Um, we usually see it from excess watering or poor drainage or, not an, or ununiform drainage. We want to grow our snapdragons a little bit on the dry size, but it's a fine margin between where we can keep the plants on the dry side and where we can keep the plants um, uniform. Because during the flower development stage, we want to have plenty of moisture so the flowers stretch out. Most growers use drip tape uh, as an irrigation system. Here's an example of the drip tape with some newly transplanted plugs. They get the drip tape right on the plant. We've got good uniform mix where the uh, water can spread out uniformly. Poor aeration. This grower is no longer in business. Where you can see he's got poor aeration uh, along the sides where the, and what was actually happening here is his workers were using kneeling pads and transplanting and kneeling in the bed itself. And they were kneeling in the, s in the beds and uh, compacting the soil. And then they were watering it too much because they felt that was getting, because they were wilting. And you can see how much they're watering because the algae development um, on the potting soil and I could not convince this gentleman that he had a weed problem. Like I said, they're no longer in business. Now, of course, the spacing that you use depends on the time of year you're transplanting, the growth habit of the plant, and, and if you're going to be pinching or not. We haven't talked about pinching. Of course, Light conditions, winter production, we're going to space uh, three to five inches, uh, three by five, three inches by five inches, or four by five, where in summer production, we're going to plant them a little tighter. Just depends on your light penetration. If you're pinching, and hardly anybody pinches snapdragons, uh, you're going to need more space because you're going to get two to three breaks off of the plant. Pinching does nothing but delay your production, and your production is actually not as efficient. Uh, pinching is not advised. You need at least two layers of flower support to keep the stems straight. We don't disbud. Uh, pinching does increase the stems, delays your cropping time, and actually doesn't give you as good a quality. But you get more, p more stems per plant. More stems per plant. Cold soil reduces transpiration and your plant quality. So they, they benefit, snapdragons benefit a lot from uh, elevated root temperatures. If it's below 50, you're actually going to get plant stunting. And, but yet, it needs cool greenhouse temperatures. Um, 50 to 52 night degree, night temperatures. So one of the ways that I like to grow this crop in the, the most effective production cycle I have grown this crop, because I've done a lot of research with it, is that cool nights, warm soils, best quality. So a raised bench with the uh, z root zone heating systems or below bench heating systems. However, it's group specific. You remember your four group categories? For instance, if group too warm, if we're growing, if we grow group one, during the summer months, we're going to get very s short stems, and they can be very soft. They're actually going to come off really fast because it's too warm. So your quality is going to be down. Group three, if you grow it too cool, it's going to have thick, grassy growth. But what they'll do with group three, some growers will take advantage of this thick, grassy, thick, grassy growth and very thick stems. And they'll grow group three in the coldest part of the year, rather than group two or one. And they'll get flower stems that could be as high as four to five feet with a stem the size of a permanent marker, a Marxalot pen. 
what market would I be targeting with a four to five foot flower stem? Weddings, Weddings is one, not so much. Oh, yeah, it it's the hotel market. Hotel arrangements, they want large arrangements. And if we can generate large, gaudy, big, huge snapdragon stems, and you can do that with group three in the winter months to get that big, huge stem, it takes a long time, but it's a premium market. And for those of you who have traveled to areas that have premium hotels, you will see this. But it takes a long time, and you've got to be able to get the good market. Light. This is a long-day facultative plant. In other words, it, respond, it blooms faster under long days, but it's not required. And you can speed your bloom slightly with, um, after you get 10 to 12 true leaves, and um, however, it will, um, Short days inhibit some stage four. You know, stage four plants, um, I mean, group four plants, those are summer bloomers. Group fours, we just about only grow those in the summer months. In fact, if you look in the catalogs, most everything that you can see to buy is either group two or three. Group two or three is what most people buy. Very few people in this country buy group one. Those, are those, those cultivars are grown by the Canadians and, and the Dutch. Group two and three is mostly in the, in the more temperate parts of the United States. We can increase growth with HID lights. Actually, all you need to use is incandescent. Carbon dioxide, we can inject carbon dioxide all day long and it won't have any impact, so we don't do it. All they need is the atmospheric CO2. If we, we inject anything higher than the atmospheric CO2, you won't see any increased photosynthesis. Not all crops respond to it. Except if it's really, really low light levels. So the Europeans will do it. So when do you harvest a snapdragon? Snapdragon is uh, a determinate or an indeterminate flower. Do you know? It's in the Scrofulariaceae family. It's family specific. Determinate means which end blooms first. Top and any term means from the bottom. So they bloom from the bottom up. So we, here we have these snapdragons are ready for harvest. It's really difficult to take garden club ladies into a green a fl cut flower greenhouse because they expect <coughs> to see things in glorious bloom. Does that look like glorious bloom? To me, it does. It's ready to go. That looks like money in the bank. So what we like to do is we like to harvest when the lower third of the florets are open. Now, snapdragons are very susceptible to geotropism. Geotropism means what? Growth response in, the, uh, in response to gravity. It grows in response to gravity. In other words, they will bend up. So if we lay snapdragons down, they will start to bend up. Uh, they're also very susceptible to ethylene. They will shatter. So we always all avoid exposure to ethylene. And actually, snapdragons are an ethylene generator if the foliage is submerged underwater. So one of the critical things to do when you harvest snapdragons is to strip the lower foliage when you put it into a vase of water or bucket of water so that they're not, the foliage isn't underwater. You see, if you work in a florist shop or a wholesale house, you'll notice that the snapdragons in their vases, and most all florists and wholesalers put their snapdragons in clear buckets so they can see the foliage that it's been stripped. Because if we put snapdragon foliage underwater in a cooler, it will generate enough ethylene to kill everything else, including itself. So make sure that this, they're stored upright and make sure that there's no foliage under. So we want to harvest that stem when the lower third of the florets are open. If we harvest it before that lower third is starting to open, it won't complete its growth cycle completely. 
these are harvested too late. So if we harvest it when it's half open or full, almost two thirds open, by the time it gets to the wholesale house and to the retailer and eventually to the consumer, the flowers are blasted and they're gone. So for the best optimum base quality, when the we want to harvest before, after they show color and before the lower third, you know, when the lower third of the florets are open. So here we have the greenhouse where that bench is ready to harvest. Geotropism, this is just a, a cooler shot where they make sure, and they, uh, the buckets are designed to prevent geotropism where the, the flowers are never laid on their side. Here you can see the, the, the water in a bucket. And we actually have buckets that are designed to fit inside boxes. And the boxes are shipped so that they're upright and they have a little bit of water in the bottom. And um, specialty uh, shipping companies are hired to to do the shipping. We don't trust FedEx to do this because they won't keep it right. And this is one of the benefits of growing snapdragons is that it grows in a cooler greenhouse. They're very sensitive to geotropism, so they don't fly well in an airplane. And we can grow this for a local market and make money. And just about everything in this planet that gets on every other plant will give you uh, uh, insect, insect problems. This is what white fly damage looks like. And white flies are phloem feeder. And as they're feeding on the phloem, that they're, they're a little bit of um, toxin that they generate as they uh, inject their proboscis into the phloem causes a pretty um, distinct curling of the flowers. Um, aphids are the same way. Um, snapdragons will get on, aphids will get on snapdragons before they'll get on any other crop. So this is oftentimes used as an indicator crop by some growers. And uh, the best thing to do if you get, they'll cluster around, uh, and they'll be on the, the apical growing area where this, the phloem is tissue is soft, and the aphids will cluster there. And sometimes the easiest way to control aphids on snapdragons is to trash those one or two plants that are contaminated throw a garbage sack over the top, cliff it off at the base, and haul it out of the greenhouse. And one of the easiest ways to find aphids in your greenhouse is to follow the ant trails. Downy mildew um, is, a, is a major problem in snapdragons. And it's, uh, you can see by the purplish um, uh, generation of spores on the underside of the foliage, causes uh, pretty heavy um, foliar damage.